And thank, thank you, David, for that lovely introduction. Um, so yeah, with Mental Health America and the Center for Health Equity at uh, Albert Einstein College of Medicine, which does a lot of um, mostly health services and intervention research focused on um, health disparities and mental health. Um, and so the big idea, so when I was thinking about how to do this, so a lot of policy talks, I think especially in digital mental health would be like, here's a bunch of legislation happening at the federal level um, and you know, it's prospects for moving and how they might impact you, but might not ultimately be very empowering at the end of the day. Um, you know, I feel like uh, the legislative process, even I work in policy and uh, all day and even impacting it is incredibly hard. Um, and I think the broader thing I wanted to talk about is how policy shapes every aspect of digital mental health and then kind of give like a menu of options for how you uh, over the course of your work, you know, for many, many years can try to target different parts that you think um, are the most important for making a change. Um, rather, and I'll tell you what I think is important, but it's really about, I think, uh, seeing kind of how policy uh, intersects all these different areas um, to figure out what role you wanna play in advocacy. Um, so the fundamental the basic idea is that policy shapes the market. Um, I think there's, you know, this kind of like libertarian sense sometimes you get that policy, you know, only shows up to fix certain things or to intrude and that there's this free market out there that, uh, you know, exists in nature. But the reality is, is that um, without policy shaping everything, uh, paper is just, you know, pieces of money and, uh, you know, there's very little that stops us from having a society versus, you know, hunting caribou for survival. Um, so kind of behind the scenes in a million different ways, uh, policy shapes who makes what and who gets it. Um, and so throughout this talk, we'll be talking about how the current policy that's in place uh, shapes the market. So specifically in digital mental health, how who does get funded to innovate? What do they make and who ends up getting to use it? Um, and that what's being created today is in some ways an artifact of how these policy incentives have already shaped a market, um, often behind the scenes, somewhat invisibly. And the big question we're gonna to seek to ask is, um, is the market as shaped by our policy incentives likely to lead to the kind of innovations that can fundamentally reduce population level prevalence and severity of mental health conditions? And I think I want that to be the big point because um, you know, like life expectancy for the first time in many decades actually declined in 2016, primarily due to the rise of uh, behavioral health concerns, suicide and opioid overdose. Um, rates of suicide and related behavioral problems or adolescents are increasing at, you know, incredible rates. I think the rate of self-harm increased by 355% um, over six years, uh, like I think between um, 2011 and 2017. And I think one of the calls we have is that it's not just about, you know, iterative improvement on services and access, but we really need solutions that are going to solve these, you know, deep problems plaguing the mental health of our nation. You know, are we on track to just have, you know, like slightly greater efficiencies or are we on track to have, um, you know, the kind of breakthroughs that I think we hope lead to a happier and healthier nation. And so I'll be kind of giving the contours of that throughout this. Uh, but then also, I think there's lots of opportunities for you to give your in input and insights into what you think it takes. And I'd love to hear that at the end. Um, so here's kind of the outline of the different sections we'll go through. Um, and it's really supposed to kind of guide, you know, throughout every step, um, how does policy shape all of this work? And then at the end, I'll talk about um, what policy activity is happening now. Like, so what are the current conversations? Um, and then what do I recommend? And I think one of the interesting things too about hearing about the current conversations towards the end is you can either choose to dive into the questions of today and kind of weigh in um, on the battles that are occurring, or I think focus more on what isn't being discussed that should be and begin building momentum for that as well. So the first question is who innovates in digital mental health? Um, and this is sort of like behind the scenes, I think influenced by policy as we'll see in the subsequent slides about who funds mental health. Um, so we have academia. So, you know, folks on this call, I think are, are key innovators uh, in everything that CBITS has created. Um, corporations, so you see, you know, Alphabet creates, uh, you know, sub products and different verticals that have different kinds of digital mental health uh, innovations. Um, you see what like Verily is doing. And then you have startups. So you have, you know, someone with an idea somewhere about how to scale mindfulness to the masses. And then you have Headspace. Um, but I think one of the biggest questions you have is who doesn't innovate? Um, 
and this could matter for you know a number of reasons like equity concerns like broader like you know ec economic equity concerns are people being left out of the innovation process um but then on the other side there could be people who have you know really fundamental insights into what it is that people need who if they had access to technical co-founders or capital um could you know bring the breakthroughs that we need but because of systemic uh discrimination aren't being given opportunities to innovate so i, I kind of want to leave that as a current in the background as we go through a lot of this so the first big policy question is who invests in digital mental health so i think a lot of the ones you'll be most familiar with are the you know, major federal funders so um nih and nsf uh, you know agencies like that um and so i think the internet I think in a lot of times we conceptualize these kind of federal research funders as kind of neutral arbiters of the evidence and they follow, you know, this is what the science is telling us, these are where the gaps are, this is where we're going to put our funding. Um, but each one of these was established by policy, you know, NIMH didn't exist one day and then Congress with a uh, you know, swoosh of its pen made NIMH and gave it uh, billions of dollars. And even today continues to be heavily influenced by policy. Um, so it is like the brain initiative was actually a separate set aside policy that gives NIH, you know, millions and I think several billions of dollars to focus specifically on brain research. So now you have federal policy setting the specific research policies of a federal agency. And you can imagine if it's of interest to you, one area of, of advocacy could be um, additional, and I think this is really common for a lot of um, societies focused on research, additional funding for specific research priorities that you care about. So wherever you see gaps in digital mental health, um, and then the agency would have the funding and be empowered to kind of tackle the places where you see a gap um, in the uh, creation of new innovations. Then the other, another area of funding is venture capitalists. Um, and they are heavily, heavily influenced by the downstream market potential, which is in turn shaped by policy. So later, let's, you know, using a healthcare example, later we're gonna talk about Medicare and Medicaid policy and regulation of the private insurance markets and venture capitalists and healthcare really, really, really are responsive to those incentives. So just as an example, there's uh, in Medicaid, there's a uh, cap on the amount of funding you can give, the states can give to uh, inpatient psychiatric uh, beds. So you can only have facilities that have 16 beds maximum um, and then Medicaid can't cover anything more. Uh, and once in a while, private equity firms call us to figure out, is there any chance that that's gonna be lifted? Because if that cap is going to be lifted, it's now hugely profitable to invest in um, you know, inpatient psychiatric wards. And we get similar calls too around, um, how is that going with creating digital mental health benefits? Um, so I think what seems like the breakthrough innovation and the, you know, the 10X, 100X growth that venture VCs wanna see is ultimately shaped by these downstream policy forces that um, aren't always so visible. I think once in a while you get uh, really excited investors who don't care that there's no downstream potential yet and hope that along the way you kind of make it so, but I think that's uh, the exception rather than the rule. And then the last area I would say is incumbent corporations. So a good example would be, um, I mean, anywhere that you see, like, for example, I think this is really common in pharmaceutical companies. Um, they see that there's a huge amount of potential in digital mental health and that that's kind of the wave of the future. And so they use their, you know, profound amounts of capital and existing regulatory power, uh, regulatory navigation power to then invest in companies like I'm thinking about like Otsuka and Click, for example, invest in companies um, or even invest internally to create new digital mental health capacities and innovations. But it also could be other things like um, changing policy, like, uh, you know, electronic health record policy gets changed. And that means that now, or something, there's a change to the way that uh, privacy laws work for digital um, health information. And so Google or Apple gets into fixing these kind of new policy opportunities that created um, by leveraging their existing products. So in a lot of different ways, I think policy influences who invests in um, even the creation of the basic innovation itself. And so this could be an area that you get excited about where you say like, oh, this, we're not seeing any innovation in this one space that I think could really have um, downstream impacts for society um, and kind of tackle some aspect of this. In this next section, I want to talk about what can't be innovated, which I think uh, is just as interesting. 
Um, and you know, for a lot of, there, for a lot of these, there's like great reasons why we can't innovate some of these things. Um, they also create some amount of friction where uh, the complexity of additional regulation, I think, makes it easier for large incumbents to have an advantage. So the FDA is like a great example, right? That's so harrowing to someone who is a researcher with an amazing idea and has no idea how to navigate the FDA. So it gives um, pharmaceutical companies, you know, people who have a lot of experience with navigating the FDA process, a huge amount of advantage. Um, and same with like HIPAA and FERPA and these other issues. Um, and it also creates opportunities for advocacy either to make regulations stricter or less strict, depending on how you think it influences innovation. So we can start with the FDA, um, which I think is actually probably one of the areas that people on this call might be most familiar with um, out of anywhere I talk about. Because uh, specifically for digital mental health, there's been this interesting paradigm. And I guess like backing up to what the FDA literally is, um, it's not just general consumer protection in the way that I think we often think about it. Like the FDA protects us from harm in a general sense. It's pretty actually focused on health products and marketing specifically. And the way that influences digital mental health is, uh, you know, they have these kind of areas of authority. And if you say that you're going to be treating or preventing a specific medical condition, then FDA says you're in our authority. Um, and if in your advertising, you're really just saying, we're gonna improve wellness in some general way and kind of hedge away from saying that you're going to be treating a medical condition, then they kind of put you in this discretionary gray area. Um, and that, has, and actually one of the interesting things during uh, the COVID pandemic, they've kind of waived all of that and said, as long as you don't hurt anyone, um, I think this was back in April, they gave guidance, they gave like a lot of flexibility to the way that digital mental health gets deployed um, specifically. But I think this is a big area for the future to figure out, um, how do you feel about the way that these products fit inside of FDA discretionary authority? Um, you know, should we be sort of more concerned that there's all these wellness apps fitting into this gray zone and allowed to enter the market and we should expand its authority on one hand. But on the other hand, you could say um, the amount of regulation we already have in place is you know, killing innovation. Um, as long as these apps don't have a serious possibility for harm, we should just let them into the marketplace and we should actually minimize FDA's role. Or I guess another third option is to kind of reimagine the way we do consumer protection for digital health technologies um, that doesn't fit into FDA's previous device medication paradigm. So I think that's in you know a really active area right now, um, where I think there's a lot of opportunities for weighing in. So I wanted to put that out as an option. Then another area you can't advocate or can't uh, innovate in is uh, some amounts of digital uh, privacy and security. So you can't do any kind of innovating that violates uh, HIPAA and the health side and FERPA on the education side, um, which I think has some potentially, you know, I think it ends up killing some amount of innovation in that people just get afraid of navigating HIPAA, maybe somewhat needlessly, um, or FERPA. And I think in some cases, because it wasn't designed with digital technologies in mind, um, it can make it harder to do kind of social uh, things. So if you're trying to have people interact with one another in some sort of supportive thing, but your matching is based on HIPAA protected information, I think that could be trickier to navigate. Um, although I think there's a lot of activity right now on making sure that HIPAA, you know, really gets to its core goal of protecting patients um, and does allow for technological innovation. So that's another big area. And FERPA is really complicated. That's the educational records because um, that gets into parental rights and access. And that could be another uh, topic too, because I know a lot of these digital mental health technologies are for children and sometimes used actually in schools um, or try to use data from educational records. Then some other areas that I don't think we talk about quite as often, I think FDA, HIPAA and FERPA will be known to people, but I also wanna talk about uh, IP protection, which is you know a mix of, we have the US patent, and, uh, patent office, which allows you to register patents. And we also have entire common law that protects your intellectual property. And I think this, so the goal of all of that, right, is to make it so that you can innovate um, and get paid so that, you know, one day Mark Zuckerberg doesn't create Facebook and the next day you create, you know, Facebooker and then steal all of his riches because you um, stole his IP, but just had a slight marketing advantage. Um, so I think in some ways creates a lot of innovation, but on the other hand, I think has become, 
uh, in a way prevented as like certain platforms gain power. We go back to Facebook. Um, you know, they sort of graciously, I think, allow some amount of API access to do some kinds of things, but it's hard to really integrate a lot of digital mental health technologies into major platforms because they want to remain a black box and protect all of their IP and not really let you tinker with anything. Um, and related to that, I would say is antitrust concerns, which I think uh, is about to be an incredibly hot topic. So you have the Federal Trade Commission and Department of Justice taking on um google right now and all sorts of different concerns and i think that really matters because if you are trying to get your innovation to people um and everybody the only real way to reach people is through these platforms or advertising on these platforms um and they are you know so much more concerned about making ad revenue than improving public health i think that makes it infinitely harder to um, reach people with your interventions. And I think even sort of more fundamentally, if you had an idea to improve on a platform, let's say, you know, that we have evidence that the Instagram like counter, you know, every time you see a photo of Kim Kardashian and someone hits like, and that sort of creates this bubble of social capital that then creates negative social comparison for other people. And we know that that can be bad for um, adolescents and young adults. Um, and you had some sort of breakthrough digital mental health intervention that would sort of change the way we interact with the platform. Uh, and improve population mental health, um, you're not able to really implement in any way because of these set of protections that make it so that these large incumbent platforms have total control over everything. Um, so I just wanted to point out the ways in which that is actually an artifact of policy and also I think a moving area of importance to this group that maybe might not have been on people's radar. Um, the last area that you can't innovate in that I wanted to bring up, which you, I, you definitely shouldn't innovate in, is uh, in the Federal Trade Commission sort of advertising thing. So if you, uh, you know, have some sort of digital mental health intervention for depression and then immediately link someone to a specific medication through an unadvertised paid partnership, um, the FTC would come after you. I think that's a great place to not innovate. Um, but I think it does, the point, part of the point of that is it does affect where the business case can come up. Um, and so all of these things force certain things to be a business case. So selling data is incredibly lucrative. Um, unannounced brand partnerships are illegal, so that becomes not incredibly lucrative, and all of this ends up shaping the market. So with that, so let's assume now at, the, at this point in the talk that you have some sort of innovation. You've created, um, you know, an exciting game for adolescents to play that addresses uh, social anxiety or, um, you know, the sort of wearable that helps people with schizophrenia manage their symptoms. Um, and now we want to get it to the world. So, uh, so I think the saddest thing would be, it would be great if you could just put it up on the website for free and people would download it and you'd achieve population level impact. But unfortunately, uh, you have to, I think, intersect with other sectors or advertising or some, you know, world of paid, uh, pol like policy controlled paid, uh, media intermediaries to reach people. Um, and this is where I think a lot of the policy battle then arises. So we're starting with healthcare, which I think is probably going to be most top of mind for people. Um, and I think we're also most of the uh, exciting sort of battles are today. Um, so let's start with what technologies will private payers cover? And so when I say cover, I mean, um, you're Achilles, you have Endeavor RX, um, you're trying to say, will the Aetna, let's say as an example, pay for Endeavor Rx itself. Um, and later we'll talk about paying for the physician time to help a family use Endeavor Rx correctly. But now we're just talking about like, can they cover the product itself? Um, so the kind of natural incentives for these private payers are they wanna acquire and retain members, reduce costs and hit certain quality ratings, which are both clinical and satisfaction. And so a lot of people try to uh, kind of maneuver and like make a business case when they're pitching to payers that they help some of these incentives. Interestingly, I think a lot of people focus on reducing costs. So saying that, you know, if you use this product, you'll use fewer antidepressants or the fewer brand name antidepressants or use, you know, less inpatient stays. Um, increasingly, I think people are making uh, cases around clinical quality and satisfaction. So that would be a case like, um, you know, a lot of health plans are scored on the extent to which people are 
uh, doing their PHQ-9 uh, screenings at regular intervals. So you say, hey, if you use our product, we'll help with your PHQ-9 reporting. You'll get 100% um, and look good to regulators. And then the last year is acquiring and retaining members, which I actually think people don't play do quite as much, but is really important. I mean, per person that joins each health plan, right? That's hugely valuable. Um, they get the premium. Uh, and I think saying that you have, um, you know, I think United uh, acquired Livongo and now can say like, hey, you know, whenever you sign up for us, you also get access to the suite of digital health tools that our competitors might not have. And that actually, because otherwise I think it's really hard to differentiate yourself as a health plan. And I live in New York and you'll see on the subway, uh, there's a ad saying, you know, like we put the health in healthcare or we put the care in healthcare. I mean, there's only so way, many ways you can really differentiate yourself without actually offering new uh, service offerings. So I think that's really important too. Um, but all of these incentives, I think, are really modified by policy. And I think that opens up a lot of opportunities for all of you. So one of the biggest areas is standardization. Um, health insurance plans hate having to figure out how to cover a new thing that's like not going to be systematic in any way. So if you say, hey, we have this great solution that affects you know, 60 out of your million patients and it'll save money and just you know, help create a benefit for us like this. And if we work on this contract, it'll be great. They're gonna say, we don't wanna do it. That's not worth you know, our lawyer's time to even figure out how to, how to pay you, um, even though we are sure that it's great. Um, so one of the things that could be hugely beneficial is having Medicare as a federal uh, leader set the stage for, here's how we should cover uh, digital therapeutics. Here's how we should pay for physicians. And here's like specifically like what should be in each code and how much we should value it. And then all the insurance companies can take that and say like, oh great, now that we have a template, we can just use that um, throughout and then um, you know, look at your individual instance through the lens of our existing standards. Um, so that's a really important area for policy. And I think there's lots of opportunities and we'll go into this in a minute when we talk about Medicare to advocate for better standardization that makes uptake into private payers more seamless. Then um, there's kind of a bundle of three I wanted to talk about together, which is mental health parity, essential health benefits, and network adequacy. So for people who aren't familiar, um, so federal law now requires, through a series of laws building on it, that you can't limit benefits for mental health and substance use any more than you limit um, medical and surgical benefits, you know, with some caveats. But basically, you know, if you say you can only have 10 visits for your outpatient mental health, uh, you have to then say you can only have 10 visits for outpatient physical health conditions and no plan would ever say that. And so um, that law has now hugely expanded uh, access to mental health care uh, and substance use care in the United States. Um, similarly, the essential health benefits required um, individual market plans and some of the other ones to cover mental health services. So now they have to cover mental health services and at parity. And then a series of further regulations require that in order for you to actually say that you cover something, you have to have people to provide the service. This sort of little consolation to say that uh, you can have all the mental health benefits you want and there's no psychologist, psychiatrist, therapist of any kind in network. Um, so there actually is now standards, uh, both at the state and federal level for what does it mean to say that you you actually cover something from a network adequacy perspective. So I think this plays in the digital mental health space in a number of ways. I mean, you could try to say that, I don't know, like diabetes, right, and asthma are getting increasing use of digital mental health tools. So you could try to say there's a parity argument there, um, or eventually as evidence grows so strong, you could say you know, that digital mental health interventions are an essential health benefit, that they should be covered like any other sort of therapy or medication management um, and that you have to have an adequate network. I think that uh, sounds like a good argument. It might not win it. Um, but I think the even more sort of profoundly impactful thing is that um, it's really hard for health plans to meet these standards. So, you know, imagine you're a health plan in rural Oklahoma and there's like no psychiatrist there and they're supposed to have a network, an adequate network and fully cover mental health at parity. Um, and they really don't have a plan to do it and they're probably just going to get sued. Um, I think then digital mental health tools give them another option. So the fact that uh, they can be compliant without uh, you know, having more psychiatrists in network because you've created um, ORTED or any of you know, other 
examples of digital uh, health tools or therapeutics, um, I think really can be quite helpful for that respect. The other part is the cost dynamic. So because they now are on the hook for covering mental health parity, um, mental health expenditures have like shot up quite a lot. And part of that's driven, I think, by increasing need, but part of it's driven by increasing requirements. And so as you know, you want to make a case that covering your digital tool will save money, your arguments getting all the stronger, the more they're having to follow these laws covering um, all sorts of other services that um, your intervention could prevent or avert. Um, so I think those are all incredible opportunities for increasing coverage in private payers. The other, I think the big unknown at the moment is going to be public option. Uh, I mean, it would be silly if it just replicated an existing health plan and didn't try to be forward looking in any way. So I think that could be another opportunity to really push innovation that is somewhat on the horizon. Um, then let's go to public payers. So we mentioned the importance of Medicare. So the biggest dilemma right now is there is just no benefit category in Medicare for digital mental health. So, uh, you know, we have outpatient coverage, we have hospital benefits, we have devices, we have medications. There is just nothing that covers digital mental health. And the uh, Office of Legal Counsel for CMS has said, um, we, we're just not going to consider digital mental health as a device or um, a kind of pharmaceutical. Uh, we don't think it fits within our statutory authority. And so we basically are legally prohibited from covering these until Congress acts to make a digital mental health benefit. Um, so that's the kind of, it's, it's incredibly high stakes, not just because Medicare covers people with disabilities or older Americans, um, which can be important people to receive your tools, but also because of its effects on private insurance. Private insurance is going to be waiting until they see what that benefit looks like to figure out how they wanna cover it so that they can have a sensible approach. So this is a really high stake current battleground because you can imagine, depending on how you define the mental health benefit, it includes or excludes quite a lot, or digital uh, health benefit, it includes or excludes quite a lot of different kinds of digital tools. So if you say it's only things that went through formal FDA clearance process, like it you know, treats a condition and has FDA approval to treat that condition, that's you know, one subset of tools versus you say anything that fits into FDA discretionary authority, that's a, you know entirely different universe of tools. Um, so this is being, this is a battle currently being fought in Congress at this exact moment, um, you know, with people on both sides of the issue uh, that I think will have a huge impact on at least, I mean, probably not digital mental health forever, but at least the first movers, like who's first to market defining what a digital therapeutic is and what do people think of when they think of digital therapeutics. The other part of this is pricing, which honestly is slightly over my head. There hasn't been a new benefit created in quite a while um, in Medicare. Uh, besides, I think, independent lab benefit. So nobody's had to figure out de novo how pricing a new benefit works. But basically what we figure is, however you decide to price this, it'll run into all the same issues as drug and device pricing. So if people follow during the Trump administration, they had this proposal where they're benchmarking the prices of um, medications that uh, Medicare Part D plans would cover to how much is being paid in countries in Europe um, in Canada and other kind of peer nations, uh, which would hugely reduce the amount paid. Um, and that was having a whole sort of conversation. And those kind of proposals would also likely cover digital therapeutics as well. Um, so I think this is a really high stakes, tense area um, with lots of different interests weighing in. Um, and I, I think it's worth thinking about what does it look like to create a responsible Medicare that stewards digital mental health while also you know, trying to meet the goals of not having rising overall costs that don't confer additional benefit. Um, that's kind of the issues we're wading through there. Then Medicaid um, is almost the total opposite. It is so much flexibility. Um, I don't think, to the best of my knowledge, and I might be wrong, uh, there's like a health affairs blog just uh, a couple months ago on this topic that Medicaid plans could, the or state Medicaid could theoretically cover digital therapeutics, but none of them have yet. Um, so there's just like a lot of flexibility, like Oregon has this you know, really complicated model of coordinated care organizations that look nothing like Tennessee's approach to Medicaid. And as part of that, uh, people think it's at least theoretically possible that 
a state could ask for Medicaid coverage for digital mental health interventions, um, even though it's not explicitly in the Medicaid statute, um, because there's this waiver authority that as long as it um, maintains or improves outcomes in the Medicaid program and doesn't increase costs relative to the benchmark required uh, amount of spending, then you kind of do it like states have the latitude to do what they want. So that could be a huge opportunity, I think, is working with states to figure out what does the future of digital mental health therapeutic coverage and payment look like to generate you know, submissions to CMS and begin building a case, which could then influence generally how all of this plays out. Um, one of the interesting kind of threads too on how Medicaid's covering uh, medications and devices too, it used to be this really sort of like closed door behind the scenes process that these like, uh, they're called like P&T meetings where people decided, like they looked at the way of the evidence and decided it and the cost and like, does Medicaid cover this one or does it not? Um, and increasingly they're going away from the sort of committee driven process and towards more formal health technology assessments. So looking at kind of cost benefit analyse analyses of um, cost per quality. And I think that could also be another kind of in where uh, you can demonstrate cost effectiveness even if it doesn't look to the committee like um, other kinds of things they've been considering to the past. The other thing is besides whatever state Medicaid itself does, Medicaid MCOs have unlimited flexibility almost. There's, they can, they're limited in what they can cover as part of the benefits they're administering, but they have administrative funds they can spend on you know, technology or for themselves, technology for the people they're serving. You know, there's all these um, things about uh, United and others investing in housing, which um, Medicaid actually says you can't cover housing directly, but you know, United through its administrative funding invests directly in millions of dollars of housing across America. So you could imagine, I think there's even some movement already in covering Unite Us, that social needs platform and a few others. So Medicaid MCOs really have a lot of flexibility in how they do that. The only issue there is because Medicaid MCOs are so flexible, it doesn't, it can influence the private um, commercial payers, but um, it doesn't tend to diffuse quite as much in that direction. Like Medicaid's quite siloed off from an organizational standpoint. Um, like there's like a head of Medicaid versus like a head of commercial. Um, so there tends to be some issues of diffusion of innovation back and forth. Um, so as I noted before, getting the actual like technology itself covered is like the smallest part of an overall battle. Um, like even if you got it covered uh, and so like, look world, you know, this is fully covered by insurance. I think maybe almost nobody would use it. Um, one of the sort of biggest first barriers would be provider time needs to be covered. So for all of these things, providers are gonna need to know how to use it. And they're gonna need to like be able to spend actual practice time um, explaining to the patient how to use it, looking at results, sort of facilitating its effective use. Um, and providers already all have full days. I mean, I'm sure you know, people on this call who focus on, um, or either in clinical settings or focus on this kind of, uh, these kind of settings really understand this, that, um, you know, they're not just waiting for an innovation to show up. They feel quite busy and already have a full schedule. Um, so there needs to be like really strong incentives that make it worth their time to figure this out. Um, so right now, the American Medical Association and CMS together are working on, and David actually sent me some of these already out, uh, the CPT code. So like what physicians bill to insurance um, that includes digital uh, time spent you know, looking at digital tools. So I think there's already a bunch out um, and looking at like re remote patient monitoring. So if you're getting PHQ-9 scores or whatever in from patients, they can get some of that time covered. Um, but as you know, you're trying to explain to a patient how to use a new kind of um, software as a, as a therapy, um, I think those there's still room to go in making sure that that's not only covered, but adequately incentivized. Because even once the code literally exists, um, getting it paid for at amount that makes it enticing is still a huge battle. Um, and there's sort of this like interesting system where all the codes are uh, valued relatively to one another. So, um, you know, a primary care code might be worth, let's just say an arbitrary number 0.5, but then surgery might be worth a three. Um, and so when CMS says, this is how much everybody gets and now split it up across these relative values, um, 
when you're looking at your healthcare system saying like, how do we maximize revenue? Uh, the threes look a lot better than the 0.5s. So when someone's deciding, should they roll out um, a new digital therapeutic, uh, the relative value of the codes and not just the existence of the codes, I think matters quite a lot to that um, business case from an organizational perspective. The other aspect is the infrastructure um, needed to enable it. So a lot of these things will require some level of technology um, and use by the providers to make clever use of it. And so, I mean, we've made incredible progress, I think, over the past decade from mostly pen and paper to, you know, most people now using EHRs for better or for worse. Um, and this has been either the, through the use of a bunch of different policy incentives. So the High Tech Act, um, which made Medicare incentives, um, in Medicaid, there's this program called MITA 3.0, which gives actually federal matching funds for investments in um, information technology architecture. And then the FCC has also created incentives, especially during COVID, for building out telehealth capabilities. So this could be another huge area of advocacy is making sure that um, providers have the kind of like next generation infrastructure they need to effectively implement a lot of these tools. Um, the last area is provider training. So even if this is, I think, one of the, the biggest mistakes we, we made, uh, we were working on collaborative care model, you know, the kind of uh, standard integrated care model. And one of the hugest breakthroughs was we got Medicare to cover the collaborative care model. Um, and so we're like, oh, this is great. Now we, you know, we have a code, we got a payment, it's pretty good. This is just gonna take off, providers are gonna start doing it. And it went like nowhere. I, it, we never even anecdotally heard of anyone doing it. Um, and the biggest problem is because, you know, all of these things require training and, uh, you know, buy-in and implementing it. And without the kind of um, echo collaboratives or whatever, Surrounding it, um, people aren't going to spend the time and energy to implement something new when nothing's you know, really fundamentally broken with the way things were already happening. So here you have um, grants from different federal agencies that set up um, educational opportunities, both pre-service and in-service to learn about um, evidence-based practices, including implementing digital mental health interventions um, could be a big area of advocacy. Um, and here I wanted to spend a quick spotlight on value-based payment. So, so far, I've talked about the entire world in terms of billing codes and fee-for-service. Um, and the big push since 2012 has been moving towards, it's called like the transition from volume to value. So instead of just trying to bill as many codes as you can, the incentive should be um, improving quality and reducing costs. Um, and so the way they do this is by um, making it so that providers actually have some amount of accountability for the total costs. So they don't just get paid more for every you know, emergency room visit, but they're now accountable based on um, some benchmarking methodology to try to reduce the amount of inpatient stays that their patients receive um, and also be accountable for their costs. So not only um, do they hit sort of like the bare minimum reporting metrics, but now um, you know, are people's hemoglobin A1Cs coming down over time? Like do a lot of their patient panel have good control? And the kind of net effect of these uh, models when they're implemented is they make providers have health insurance-like incentives. So now, the ins now providers start to care about um, panel size, like do they have enough people um, signed up with them? Uh, are they reducing costs? Are they improving quality? Uh, is satisfaction high? And so I think that creates a lot of opportunities to also implement digital mental health interventions um, in the context of value-based payment because they, uh, you know, their incentives are kind of aligned with, I think, a lot of the goals of digital mental health. Um, and I guess the, I want to talk about kind of the arc of that um, generally. So in the future, I think there's probably going to be, in the past 10 years, they've seen a lot of like little tiny models. Like, so there's like the big ones, like accountable care organizations, but there was also ones focused specifically on ambulances or um, specifically on total joint replacement. And I think, there might be less interest in some of those and more on sort of like broad, like here's accountable care organizations, both stronger, better crafted incentives that do X and Y. And I think that could be another place for people interested in technology to get in on the conversation to figure out, um, are these incentives adequate to motivate providers to really change their behaviors and use the latest technology and get the best outcomes for patients? Because I think honestly, from my experience, the answer has been no. Um, it's pretty easy to just do the bare minimum reporting and hope that the secular trend just favors you. 
um, you know, in some areas, you know, you already had good quality improvement things going on and medications are getting more effective and all this. And you know, probably I mean, you might reduce costs relative to what you did last year, as long as you hit your reporting requirements. Um, so I think there's going to be a big focus on making sure those incentives are meaningful. And that could be a big area of advocacy as well. Um, and then conscious of time, I'll kind of go through this one quickly. So um, even if some insurers cover something, that doesn't mean that patients can access it. I mean, first, there's still people who are just completely uninsured. Um, so any amount of insurance coverage is irrelevant to them. And then the other problem is co-pays and deductibles can be totally unaffordable. So if you're if the digital therapeutic ends up being covered, but is it a high level of cost sharing that makes it completely prohibitive? I mean, you can imagine, especially if it's a subscription service and they have to cover 50% of the cost, that could be absolutely prohibitive. Um, so that could be a big barrier. And there we see options like Medicaid expansion and uh, addressing issues in the ACA, public option. So I think any kind of advocacy you do for general insurance coverage would also benefit digital therapeutics in the future. Um, not everybody can access a provider. So for a lot of these tools, I know having some sort of touch point with primary care, with psychiatry, with um, some kind of provider ends up being important. Well, I mean, some, I think, you know, you can just download from your phone, but others you need to, are physician mediated. Um, so that's where things like network adequacy standards, like, and workforce incentives do other loan repayment opportunities for primary care to go practice in that area in rural Oklahoma I mentioned before where there might not have been a provider. Um, is there telehealth compacts so that uh, providers can offer telehealth across state lines? Um, is there good physician extender policies so that everybody doesn't need to see an MD for everything, but um, you know can see someone that does meet their needs that might be available in that area? And so I think those could all be other fruitful areas of policy where um, the digital mental health community kind of lift all ships by fighting for access more broadly. And then finally is really the, the digital divide um, in the access area. So people might not have phones that are capable of you know, implementing these technologies. And so there you have, uh, for example, the FCC as the lifeline program, which um, gave people funding to have smartphones um, with some level of capability there's initiatives on rural broadband. And I think all of that um, is another really important domain for digital mental health. And I'm gonna go through these areas pretty quickly. Um, so these are other sectors that you can kind of latch onto as opportunities for funding digital mental health um, besides healthcare. So education could be a big one. Um, I know there's a lot of interest in um, you know, digital mental health uh, tools that are integrated into educational programs or that are part of um, individual education plans. Uh, I think the biggest concern here is that education is so much worse, like less, receives so much less funding than healthcare. Um, so if you're trying to decide who should pick up the tab on um, digital mental health interventions, I would advocate for healthcare over education any day of the week. Um, you know, teachers are hugely underpaid. Um, you know, there's schools that don't have doors on their toilets. Uh, there's just a lot of challenges. And I think um, achieving the kind of integration you want through education funding would be challenging unless you were, you know, advocating to grow the pie as a whole. Because part of what the slide shows is there is actually a ton of flexibility to do that. Um, the new major education law, or not so new anymore, Every Student Succeeds Act allows states to kind of create their own plans for how they want to uh, administer federal funding for education. And it's actually much less purely academically focused than previous iterations. So it allows states to spend more time focusing on social emotional learning and um, kind of total well being than before. Um, so there are opportunities, I think, to integrate digital mental health there. And the IDEA, um, which is the you know way that uh, you get services for kids with uh, serious emotional disturbance, um, has a good deal of flexibility. Um, but again, this the problem with underfunding. I think is so dramatic. I have seen some interesting uh, examples where like there's one digital mental health company where their entire business case was they would just prevent out of district placements for students. Um, so if a student has uh, so there's emotional disturbance and can't be, you know, kind of uh, learned successfully in that school, the school district will still have to pay for them to go to a school somewhere else. 
And that could be um, a six figure cost that they have to provide under um, existing disability law. Um, and this, the, the sole business model of this one product was just preventing that from occurring because it ended up being um, so uh, cost saving for the, um, so next let's go on to public health. So my hope here is that this will actually be more of an opportunity in the future post COVID because now that we see the importance of public health today. So basically, you know, at the top of public health infrastructure is, uh, you know, centers for disease control and prevention. Um, and then you have, you know, SAMHSA, HRSA, these other kind of public health -ish funders. And then at the state and local level, you have public health agencies, but really they end up administering this fragmented block grants that all focus on different things. And there's not really a sense of public health as you would, as you would think of it. There's, you know, these people focus on sexually transmitted infections, and these people focus on reducing hypertension, um, and not necessarily like cross-cutting um, themes of population health promotion. And hopefully coming out of COVID, there could be more of a focus on a robust public health infrastructure. And part of that could be thinking about um, more digital mental health tools as a public good as part of public health, like you have in other countries where there's sort of like state-sponsored uh, opportunities for digital mental health engagement. Um, and you can imagine since there is state and local public health authorities, sort of more hyper-local um, digital mental health opportunities as well. Then community development, I wanted to highlight is kind of similar. There is another area of funding that focuses on, um, you know, revitalizing communities. And there's a lot of focus increasingly on technology. So like smart cities and digital placemaking. And I think that could be another area in the future um, as well. So I'm going to go through this quickly because I know we're about out of time. Um, so one area, I know a lot of digital mental health companies try to go straight for employers. So I wanted to just bring up some of the roles for policy there. Um, basically, federal regulations on benefits make it so that they have to care you know, about certain aspects of employee benefits. So that's where mental health parity comes in. Employers are on the hook for um, mental health benefits for their employees so that that makes them care about costs. Uh, there's Americans with Disabilities Act that require um, you know, reasonable accommodations for people with mental health conditions. So that could be another area of kind of interplay with employers. Um, then I think there's some other like kind of interesting frontiers, like the uh, the office that focuses on safety, um, occupational sa uh, health and safety, a CDC, is increasingly interested in workplace well-being and mental health. And I think there could be an opening in the future for thinking about psychological safety as a domain of workplace safety. Um, I think it's not really fully come to age from a policy perspective, but that could be if you know that does get implemented, that would be a new set of uh, requirements on employers that then they would look for technological solutions to help them um, go under compliance and promote psychological safety for employees. Um, so finally, I mean, one option, right, for with all digital mental health interventions is going straight to consumers. And I think one key domain of this I wanted to bring up is um, the equity concern. So the consumers that can pay for it directly through uh, it being advertised to them are the people who have the money to do so. Um, so this kind of goes into general ec uh, economic policy. Um, and there's also, I think, the related issue of data selling. So a lot of things make it to consumers through for free because they sell their data. Um, but I don't think people view everyone's data as valuable as everyone else's when you're trying to reach certain advertisers. So I think there's also key equity concerns in that as well. Um, in addition to the kind of platform regulation issues where do these platforms have such a stranglehold over your ability to capture consumer attention that you can't even reach them at all. And I think these are actually some interesting emerging areas. I know Facebook got a fair housing um, suit for allowing advertisers to not advertise uh, housing opportunities to black Americans, for example. Um, but you could imagine there's all sorts of issues related to um, who would get to see what advertisement and how you can monetize things through data um, generally that raise key equity concerns. Um, so really quickly, I kind of touched on a lot of this. Um, so digital mental health as opposed to I'd say like three years ago is now big business, um, you know, just huge amounts of money 
flowing in. Um, and this policy space has become incredibly high stakes um, compared to it being like, what if it was digital mental health? I think um, even not so many years ago. Um, oh, and I also want to bring up, there's also other things that have mental health impacts that don't aren't squarely digital mental health interventions at all, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, like user-led communities on Discord that um, you know create important social connection and opportunities for people who otherwise um, might not get to meet other people with their shared experiences. So there's even like other areas of technology now sprouting up that have mental health impacts that don't even fit into the digital mental health paradigm. And so the state of play today is there's a lot of focus on defining this benefit category, on determining the future of FDA regulation, um, ironing out CPD codes, and um, figuring out how does it fit into other healthcare policies. And finally, I just wanted to re uh, return to the first question we asked, and sorry, the slide's a little chopped up, um, about how do we get breakthroughs that really address population level prevalence? Um, so the three areas I think I'm probably most interested in that are sort of like off the beaten path. So one is getting more innovation from those with lived experience. I think so much of digital mental health has rightly focused on getting evidence-based programs from the analog world into a digital format, um, which you know mostly were created without the input of those lived experience. Um, and I think there could be lots of opportunities, especially as population level mental health worsens and we don't really have good explainers for what are these changing risk and protective factors that people face today um, for, in a, for people with lived experience to have the key insight that then leads to the breakthrough policies. And so I think even things like funding for STEM programs and fellowships uh, in different areas can allow um, people with different backgrounds to have access. Um, the kind of PCORI model where you require funding to have some amount of um, research funding to have input from those with lived experience could be really powerful. And then also the in, uh, increasing access to open source tools, so publicly funding tools that allow people with uh, lived experience to directly create things without having as much technical expertise. Um, Outcomes-based financing, so that would be increasing opportunities to have sort of uh, digital rollouts at the level of place. So if you wanted to have here in Cincinnati, digital mental health interventions that are specific to those people, you could imagine different kinds of fancy financing mechanisms that um, try to address the kind of drivers of cost in a specific region. And then finally, I've talked a lot about um, making rooms on platforms. So there's gonna be lots of like interesting antitrust litigation and everything. But with that, I wanted to make sure we had a minute for Q&A. Thank you. That was fantastic. Um, and we do have a question and I know in our limited few minutes and if anyone else has any more, but I'm going to read off what um, what we received. So a huge segment of users. Um, so let me start again. A huge segment of users of commercially available apps are the quote worried well. That is those with subthreshold symptoms of depression and anxiety or who use the app for quote stress. How should we as researchers think about this segment of the population? They would likely fall outside of the realm of payers if they don't meet criteria for diagnosable conditions, for example, other than an adjustment disorder. And um, we're curious for your thoughts. Yeah, that's so I think payers actually are increasingly concerned about um, subclinical levels of depression symptoms, or just all sorts of mental health symptoms. Um, I mean, apart from a differentiator, like people are experiencing, like at this exact moment, right, people are experiencing immense distress and people want solutions and having insurance companies getting to say like, hey, if you sign for us, we have you know, we'll give you a subscription to Calm or something, just as an example, um, I think is an important differentiator. I think also to the extent technology allows things, you know, interventions to be really scalable and that there's no, that you see sort of preventive or promotive effects from a lot of digital mental health interventions for those with subclinical thresholds. And it also treats clinical levels of need. Um, I think there'll be increased interest in kind of not worrying so much about um, do you have a diagnosis, but just kind of expanding access to certain digital tools to the plan's entire user base who need it? Um, and then just, you know, worrying more about whose needs don't the existing tools meet. Um, so I think that like a lot of these kind of clinical dichotomies will become, could become less meaningful as technologies get to scale. Um, and we need to worry less about rationing scarce resources along those lines. I see there's, there are no other questions in here and there, we're just about out of time, but I'm going to take my prerogative here uh, and just ask, uh, ask a question. Um, early on, you mentioned, you, you know, the FDA as a, as a, a regulator and, you know, one of the things that 
you know, we hear from stakeholders it's, is that the FDA really provides only kind of a minimal threshold of, you know, effic of, of efficacy criteria, usually from trials that are conducted under ideal circumstances. So, you know, it doesn't really provide the level of information that most payers want in, in selecting a tool, and they often don't have, you know, much expertise. And so I'm wondering what your thoughts are about where, as, as, as digital mental health evolves in this country, where sort of providing those kinds of evidence standards might reside or how that might be done uh, in, in, a, in, in, in the United States. Yeah, that's such a good question. And I think one of the like the biggest things we want, we want to avoid is making it harder for digital tools than it is for pharmaceuticals. Um, because then you would have created such a profound kind of disincentive um, to innovate in the digital space where you actually could have far less likelihood of harms and adverse effects versus um, pharmaceuticals, which only have this minimal threshold, like you mentioned. Um, and so, you know, generally, I mentioned health technology assessment earlier. We don't have um, NICE like the UK does. We have some independent bodies like ICER. Um, I think there could be opportunities for sort of like public private collaboration. Like right now, for example, um, America's health insurance plans and CMS have this core quality measures collaborative where they're like, this is too confusing. There's too many measures. Everybody hates this. Let's just agree on some and then go with it. And that becomes the, the way they solve it. And it's not, it's like not quite policy. Um, and I think that an opportunity like that could be really profound where you have payers, both public and private payers sort of collaborating to figure out how do we make sense of this um, in a way that doesn't create additional regulatory thresholds that undercut digital innovation. Well, we are uh, about out of time. So I know people are getting off, but there's, if you have a moment, there is one other question in oh, here. Oh, yeah. Um, Andrew, do you want to read it or should sure. I? Sure. Um, thank you for an amazing overview of digital mental health policy considerations. Um, what are the, some of the most robust ways to identify those with lived experience who would be interested in participating in some way in the design process or policymaking process for digital mental health? So for example, advertising opportunities for users, forums, social media, professional societies. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I guess since I work in advocacy organization, you know, partnering with groups like Mental Health America or NAMI or Depression Bipolar Support Alliance could be good one good way of doing it. Um, I think you alluded to some others, you know, there's like Discord communities, Facebook groups, all these different kinds of like already digitally focused ways that people with lived experience are connecting with one another. And I think that could be really profitable because then you kind of positively select for people with interest in this. Um, I think also at a lot of institutions, they, they have some kind of CBPR folks that might already have really good community connections that you could kind of lean on to. Um, but I think it is an emerging area that hopefully over time we can build out, like how do you kind of more systematically create those connections? All right, Nathaniel, thank you very, very much for a, a, a terrific talk and an overview on a, a, you know, the remarkably complex quote unquote system we have here in, in this country. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks everybody for attending.